Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Before we begin, I want to warn you that this episode includes discussions of American politics as well as global geopolitics. It's normally something I avoid publishing because I try to remain apolitical in my professional life. However, our guest today has a strong background in this area, and I felt he was the right person to record and publish this with. It is also time-sensitive due to mentioning the upcoming election in the U.S., so I pushed it ahead of all the other guests to ensure it went live before the election on Tuesday. I do hope you continue to stay with us for the whole episode, because it's really an interesting conversation about the past, current, and our opinions about the future situation of the world. So let's talk more about him. Our guest today is Cenk Sidar, an American-Turkish entrepreneur and global risk expert with extensive experience promoting democracy and consulting governments, top financial institutions, and multinational corporations. He's based in Washington, D.C., and he's the founder of Global Wonks, the world's first real-time expert network. His platform lets companies from around the world ask questions, and the most appropriate experts are recommended to answer them. Sometimes, the companies pick the expert they like the most to do a follow-up call that could lead to a paid consulting gig. I met Cenk when his team replied to a question I posted online for entrepreneurs to respond to. Despite such a serious and professional introduction that I was given about him, when I spoke to him during our intro call, he was really laid back and happy to talk about whatever topics I threw at him. I got the feeling that he knew a lot about his product and his mission, and I know you'll enjoy hearing from him. Today we honor his ability to work amongst many different cultures in a way that creates beneficial outcomes for everyone. So let's give Jank a warm welcome. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever-increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thanks for joining us today. I know you're in Washington, D.C. What is the climate like with the election so close? Thanks, Sean. Uh, it's great to be on your show. Uh, yeah, Washington is hectic these days. Uh, only as, if, as we're talking now, there are only four days left to the elections. And there's a lot of uncertainty and a little bit concern about the stability in the city and in the country, of course, while we are been facing the COVID problem. So we see how things going to turn out in a few days, I guess, if we are able to learn what's, who is winning. But most likely, we will need a few more days, if not weeks, to learn the result of the elections. Yeah, it's interesting because since I'm in Vietnam, you're a lot closer to what's happening than I am. What I've heard over here is that a lot of people that are going to be voting for Trump are going to vote in person, but a lot of people who are voting for Biden have already voted by mail. So we could find out the evening of how many votes Trump got, but it could take several weeks to find out how many votes Biden got. Yes, and that's the concerning point, because it's likely that Trump may announce a victory the night of the elections, looking at the existing vote count, and that may trigger some sort of uh, unrest in certain cities that are already, you know, mobilized with the uh, BLM movement and other concerns that they were on the streets. And unfortunately, I was walking on the street yesterday and I saw some stores start being boarded up again after BLM. So they're putting like this large boards to protect it. And I asked the store owner, hey, what you, why are you doing this? He said like, look, everyone is talking about potential civil unrest, social unrest denied of the elections. And unfortunately, last time, even though I believe the, the whole movement was extremely rightful and legit, some people were just at this protest to loot stores and the liquor stores were at the 
top of the target list and many liquor stores were looted and I saw two liquor stores on the way, you know, walk into my office being boarded up. That's a definitely a major concern for everybody, I guess. Yeah, it's really concerning for me over here because I don't know what's going on. All I hear is there's almost a hundred thousand daily new cases and you know, you you have these secret police in Portland, you have people being arrested at the protests, being detained and then deported out of the country who are not citizens, all sorts of crazy things going on. And I just I, I have to be thankful that I'm not there because I think I'd I I don't know what I would do if I was there, but I feel bad because my family is there and I don't know what to do for them. I can't really do much, to be honest. Yeah, Sean, I think it's a smart choice to be in Vietnam these days. Uh, unfortunately, U.S. failed the COVID test big time because of the administration's wrong policies, I believe. The cases have been rising. I'm lucky I'm in D.C. and D.C. seems uh, relatively better compared to other cities, but the Midwest and there are some new hotspots that is occurring in the U.S. And it's very difficult to fight pandemics with an administration that doesn't take it serious and playing it down. So I'm worried about the direction of COVID, no, no matter of who wins, but especially if we have another term for Trump, I'm not sure uh, how we're going to be really tackling this issue. I'm really concerned about this. I think we all are. And it's kind of sad, but a lot of people I talk to that are based outside of America, we just kind of have to laugh at the whole situation about how horrible everything is over in the States right now. And a lot of people just kind of think that America is the laughing stock of the planet at this point. Yeah, it's difficult to laugh at the situation when almost 250,000 people are dead. But I agree, unfortunately, this this is, I mean, this is a global, let's, let's be fair, this is a global concern. The Europe and especially France, Germany, Czech Republic uh, have been facing another spike this week and they went to another lockdown. So it's a global concern, but at least you have tools to mitigate that. And those tools have not been wisely used at a federal level uh, in the United States. Some states did a good job, but again, I think it's very destabilized ecosystem in the U.S. right now, politically, uh, economically, and also socially due to all these concerns and issues that we've been facing. So let's see how things play out in, in next Tuesday in the elections. And I hope uh, we will be seeing the normalization in the country and also in the world. Very diplomatic answer from a, from a diplomatic person. <laughs> I know you've had a lot of experience working with governments and uh, you've given speeches to them. I think you you spoke to Congress once, I believe. I was involved in Turkish politics for a long time. I was uh, I was involved at, with with the main opposition party, advising the leadership on foreign policy and uh, economic issues. I also ran for a member of parliament in Turkey in 2015. So I ran a campaign in Istanbul talking to various organizations and individuals, of course. I was part of the Social Democratic Party, which is not the current uh, leadership in Turkey. I was working towards more democratic and free Turkey, while the current leadership have, have, have not been pursuing those ideals, mostly taking the country towards more conservative and authoritarian path. But after 2015, uh, I didn't make it to the parliament. So I came back to the United States, focused on my private sector initiatives. But I always talk about social issues, political issues. I'm still a champion of democracy in Turkey and the region. Uh, I was able to share my vision for Turkey or think tanks in the US. I delivered a speech at the British Parliament about three years ago about the direction of Turkey. But also I'm a frequent talking head at different the TV and the podcasts on Turkey as well. In addition to my entrepreneur and startup identity, I believe. <laughs> I'm happy that there's still people like you that are coming to America and trying to not only make America better, but see how you can help your home country still. And, and that's really great. And I really appreciate that. But I want to take it back a little bit further and try to understand what interested you in coming to the U.S. in the first place. And when did you come and what made you want to stay all this time? When I first came, I had zero intention staying here beyond my education. 
So I came to the United States uh, as part of my second year of my graduate program, graduate school, Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. So if you get into the master's program at size, you do your first year in Bologna, Italy, and the second year you come to the Washington DC, United States. And my goal was basically, okay, I do one year in Europe, get European experience, do my second year in the US, get American experience. In total, I get the transatlantic Thank you. Uh, exposure, you know, learning about uh, the European-American relationship, transatlantic security cooperation. But um, after my second year, it made sense to spend some time in the U.S. learning more about private sector, how Washington and New York operate. So I had decided to stay a few years in the United States after I finished my uh, master's program at Johns Hopkins. Staying here, I got a job at the American Turkish Council which still connected me to Turkey. That was great, working with American private sector, doing business in Turkey and the region. But yeah, I had zero intention staying longer, but I think what happened, the, the first job I got, and then I got married, I had kids. Uh, so all these uh, life events made me stay here. And now I'm here. I mean, I feel that I'm American Turkish and also a global citizen. So I don't really believe in physical location that much, especially with what we've been experiencing last eight months, I believe. Well, it's a really interesting story. I know for me, I, I went to China and I didn't think I would stay there 10 years, but I did. After I left, I came to Vietnam and I was supposed to only come for a month. I stayed for six and then I left. I went to do some travel, came back ended up staying another few months and then left, went went back to the States to visit my family. My dad got sick. I had to stay for almost a year to take care of him. And then as soon as he was good, I said, all right, I'm going back to Asia. Oh, where are you going? Oh, I'm just going to go to Vietnam. And it's been another year already that I've been in Vietnam. Or no, it's been almost a year and a half, actually. Wow. And I got engaged to a Vietnamese girl. So now I'm... Now you're stuck, my friend. <laughs> so I think, I think life kind of just happens. You know, I, I was never expecting to stay in Vietnam. You know, I was I was going to spend 12 months traveling to different countries and see the next country that I was interested in. And then Vietnam just kind of became that country and, you know, life just kind of happened. So, yeah, I totally get it. The difference between our situations is that I'll never be Vietnamese and I'll never feel Vietnamese. And I think that's a problem with Asian culture in general because I, I spent a decade learning Mandarin. I can read, I can write. I'm one of the most fluent people in their culture, their language, their psychology that I know. And yet for all of my hard work, I will never be an American Chinese or a Chinese American. I will never have a Chinese citizenship. I will never be taken seriously as a person with intent towards China. And that was a bit hard to swallow even though I kind of knew because they're a very homogenous society like Korea and Japan and a lot of Asian countries are very homogenous. And I think that's why it's so hard for someone to break into the culture. But it's easy for them to leave and go to America and assimilate into American culture with obviously relative difficulty, but it can be done. You can become an American citizen. There's no hope of becoming citizens in those countries and nobody would really want to because their passports don't really give you much of an advantage. But look, this is what made America America, right? I mean, people, immigrants uh, going to America and building lives, building their habitats and building companies uh, made America America. And that's the greatest thing about the country. And unfortunately, we've been facing the risk of losing this with closing the borders and creating xenophobia, these limitations on uh, visa situations. You know, the Trump administration basically almost eliminated the H1B visa route to American system, which attracted a lot of smart engineers, the STEM people, and people who decided to move to the U.S. after studying in the U.S. and learning about the culture. Those things, unfortunately, will really challenge America's leading position 
in the world, in business and politics and in culture, uh, because as you said, it's very difficult to be even Turkish if you move to Turkey after a life in the UK or Europe, uh, US like you did. It's almost impossible to be Israeli, you know, if you are not uh, Jewish. It's impossible to be Turkish if you are not really coming from the Turkish uh, origins. You can get the passport, but still, but America is uh, unique in that form and that's the biggest strength of the country. And I hope that will be preserved. Yeah, I think America is a lot further along in the degradation of that system and in terms of the brain drain that's being created because a lot of these people, they go to America either to study or to work because they have more political freedom, more religious freedom, more economic freedom, and they can send money back home and give their families a much better life. And it doesn't really cost much out of their own salary to make that happen because these startup jobs and these high paying private sector jobs give them that opportunity. But the reason those jobs exist is because the American education system is so poor quality that the average person isn't really learning the skills that they need to really survive in the 21st century because the education system is still designed for teaching people to be zombies in factories. It's meant for industrialization and we haven't modernized the education system. We haven't modernized how work happens. That's a huge problem. But somehow a lot of the immigrants are coming and saying, hey, I can do it better. And they found these companies that become multi-billion dollar companies. And they're creating more jobs and more opportunities. And they're furthering a lot of the technology. And what's happening in the US now is basically saying, yeah, we don't want you here. Just go away. But what they don't realize is Google wasn't built by white men. It was built by Indians and Chinese, wherever people come from. But a lot of them are from Asia, really. Uh, you know, Southeast Asia, some of them are from Eastern Europe. I know a lot of companies that hire, uh, you know, people from Poland and other countries that are former Soviet bloc, you know, nations or satellites. They are the ones building American wealth. And yet America is turning its back on that. I just think it's a really bad idea. I try not to be political. This is the most political I have been on air. It's just so hard to keep silent. I mean, especially when things are crazy, it's impossible to be apolitical. We need to be political at times when the politics is a mess. And unfortunately, today, everywhere, politics is a mess. So I think that will drive citizens to be more politically active and try to fix things uh, while things are in, in a bad shape. So we see. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. So I'm curious to know, when did you become interested in international relations, politics, and cross-cultural communications? Look, I remember myself being six years old and buying European newspapers in Istanbul and trying to read it without even uh, knowing what it says. I was always interested in international affairs. I was always interested in other cultures, understanding what they like, what they eat, what they consume. Growing up in Istanbul, also a great experience because Istanbul is very cosmopolitan city. I had neighbors from different parts of the world and different religions, different cultures. So unlike many other Middle Eastern or European states, it's like Istanbul was kind of a microcosm of the world when I was growing up. So I decided to study international relations. You know, in Turkey, we have this centralized national examination. So you basically choose what you're interested in, and then you take the exam, and then the system matches you with the highest program you match. So you, you don't know if you're going to be a medical doctor or engineer or, uh, <laughs> or computer scientists until you have your results coming so like it's funny uh, <laughs> of course you can change certain things after you get it but it's not that easy so I got into the business but then I added international relations as my second major and I enjoyed international relations because international relations is such a multidisciplinary formation basically you learn about history you learn about economics you learn about politics you learn about psychology it's not even a discipline it's a mixture of disciplines I loved international relations and I did my master's in international energy policy and European studies 
at Johns Hopkins. And then I found myself uh, helping American companies dealing with Turkish government and Turkish companies in 2007 to 2010. That was kind of a diplomatic experience because I was sitting with ministers. I was sitting with CEOs negotiating with bureaucrats and ministers and the prime minister and president at that point. And then I did that on a regional and global level, running my own firm. After my experience at American Turkish Council, I started researching consulting companies that are global advisors, and that helped me to understand the regional dynamics and the regional political risk and macroeconomic factors. Uh, later on, with my current venture, Global Wongs, now we are fully global. And my international relations experience went from Istanbul, Turkey, region and the world right now so it's interesting uh, adventure yeah it's it is very interesting and it's it's been a similar experience for myself my own background is in psychology i have a bachelor's in that i had thought about studying international relations for a master's i chose not to but as i've gotten older i have built my own kind of discipline for being very interested in history and economics and business at a global scale, but also at a micro scale. I've been to about 40 countries at this point. And when I say that, I don't mean I, you know, I hopped a border and hopped a border again. And I said, I've been in the country. Like when I go to a country, I try to spend about a month at least in that country, going to different places and learning about it and building a network wherever I go. And as I'm there, I also am learning about their economy and their society and a little bit about their language and the history and the politics and a lot of those things are really fascinating because I've found that even if you don't realize it, the tiniest thing that happens, like for example, there was a problem with oil, I think that was in Saudi Arabia a few years ago and, and OPEC and all of the production. And I live next to Malaysia and I go to Malaysia quite frequently, several times a year uh, for about a week or two each time. One time I went and the uh, exchange rate had collapsed. And I was like, I understand because I know that Petronas is a massive oil producer in Malaysia. And so about 40 or 50 percent of the GDP for Malaysia comes from this company. They, they have thousands and thousands of employees and they contribute directly back to the government. And because the uh, OPEC issue, the value of oil went down, so their GDP went down, and so the value of their currency collapsed, like overnight. This is the amazing thing about international affairs. There is a very interesting story about that, you know, the Syrian war. The real reason was climate change caused that year the drought in Syria. So they didn't have any harvest that year because of like the increased heat compared to previous years. That was the first step in the whole revolt against the Bashar regime in Syria because the farmers lost their income. They wanted subsidies and the administration didn't take enough steps to help those farmers. And that created a regional, a micro revolt against the Bashar Assad in Syria. Then it slowly expanded beyond the small towns and went to other uh, cities and it became a national uprising. Uh, and that created the whole Arab Spring in Middle East. So the other countries, the, the many regimes got toppled, like Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. Imagine like the increase in temperatures that causing drought in Syria created like a huge wave of uh, political unrest in the whole region. I mean, the same thing today with uh, the social and political issues, the the tragic death of George Floyd. 20 years ago or 30 years ago, no one would even know about that. With technology and social media and everything, things become like a flash reasons for revolt uh, and instability. So it's really fascinating to see how everything in the world is now connected to each other. International relations today is not on the politics or diplomacy or boring history. It's about the science. You need to understand how climate change impacts economic development. You need to understand how uh, pandemic uh, would drive social inequality in certain countries that may cause 
trouble in the next 5, 10, 20 years. So those are issues that require multidisciplinary approach and no expert, no scientist, no international relations expert can explain those dynamic factors in today's day and age. With all of your experience in international relations across multiple countries and multiple governments, what has been the weirdest experience that you've had? So I was in uh, Ghana negotiating an infrastructure deal for an American Turkish company in 2010 or 11 or so. And we basically, you know, as American company, we are tied to like certain regulations, FCPA, you know, you need to be very careful in your conversations with the ministers. We are very strict on this. We having meetings with the ministries in Ghana, with the ministers. Uh, and all the ministers were great. I mean, they were, there was nothing like that. They were talking about uh, the issues in that and the projects and we, we are about to sign MOU. I'm with the CEO of the company. I'm their global advisor. I have a lawyer. We're waiting on the waiting hall of the Ministry of Roads and Highways, I believe. And it was like close to Christmas time. I would say it was like early December or so. And we're talking about we're finalizing our proposal and we know our main competitors are Chinese companies because Chinese infrastructure companies in Africa are very aggressive. They are getting these mining concessions. They say, hey, look, we don't want to charge you. Just give us the mining concession in that gold mine and we will build your bridges, roads, highways, airports, ports for free. It's a good short-term deal for African governments, but it's an awful deal for the long-term because you're basically giving long-term concession and they're building shitty infrastructure because they're just doing it for the sake of building it, right? So we're sitting on a waiting hall and then all of a sudden I see like 40 Chinese people raiding into the ministry with this huge Christmas gift baskets. <laughs> it's like... $200 worth of Christmas goodies, you know, like a nice whiskey and, you know, European chocolates, uh, all the expensive Christmas souvenirs. And there are 40 of them, and they're so mission-oriented. They even gave us one, thinking that we work in the ministry or something. But then I say, oh, wow, this is how they operate. I mean, we are talk thinking about our substance. We are thinking about the technical details of our proposal. And now they are just giving every secretary, every junior associate, $200 worth of Christmas basket. They're creating sympathy for Chinese companies. And we are there, like as American-Turkish joint venture, or proposal is based on value add for the country, not for individuals. So like then I'm like, okay, do you cannot compete with these guys because this is what they do on the surface. Those Christmas baskets are illegal for FCPA because they're over a certain dollar value. I mean, this is what you can only see with your eyes. I'm sure I was like, okay, there are a lot of things probably happening behind the scenes. We were given the chance of bidding for the project, but we lost it because the competitor was building it for free. That was the most weird experience that I lived at the intersection of global business diplomacy and negotiations. But I'm happy now that I think many African countries are aware of the fact that the Chinese interest is very short-sighted in the country. So they are working more and more with Western countries, the Europeans, Canadians, Americans, because uh, even if they pay a little bit more upfront, they get higher quality and their resources are not being exploited like the Asian counterparts. Yeah, having lived in China for so long, I definitely saw that. I have a really good friend who's from Serbia and he said that they went into Serbia and they built out a lot of infrastructure. There's a lot of Chinese people living there now and it basically the country's falling apart because the Chinese built everything. Having lived there, I know they build a 30-story building in a year. In five years, it's ready to fall apart. It's not good quality materials because they don't care. They're not building for long term because their goal is to make money and get out. A lot of the deals that they do, especially in Africa and South America, are designed to exploit their resources, as you said, because they end up owning those things. They end up putting these countries in economic debt that they can't get out of. And guess what? They won because America goes in and says, do what we want or we'll replace your government. And China says, 
yeah, we'll build your stuff for free. So of course China won because they're not changing governments. They're making everyone's life better. So how could you hate the Chinese because you can't see what they're doing? America, you can see what they're doing. You can see the CIA coming in and taking over your government. Like you can see this stuff. Nobody's innocent. I mean, nobody's innocent global system. We know that my example was totally around the business interests, but you're right. I mean, unfortunately, the world is a wide place, especially in politics and international relations. One thing that I'm concerned is this, uh, this global rivalry between China and the U.S. next 10, 25, 50 years that may cause a significant political and military clash, I believe. I think people are too naive to think that's not on the table. But no, I mean, the world history is full of nations fighting each other militarily. So why do we need to believe that it's not going to happen <laughs> this century that happened technically every single century last thousand, uh, 2000 years? That's why I think responsible leadership by these two countries is the key to global stability and definitely we don't have that in the US and hope it may change after Tuesday and China has its own stability in terms of leadership. I hope things uh, will be better after November 5th. The problem with China is that their goals don't align with the goals of almost every other country. Okay, so economically, their goals try to align because for the longest time that we can remember, China was manufacturing everything for a lot of these other countries. Because of the trade war, for example, a lot of Chinese companies and Japanese companies, a lot of companies that were invested in manufacturing in China have actually moved their manufacturing to Vietnam. So Vietnam is booming economically. It's about 75 to 8% right now every year because of not only just the trade war, but because it's Southeast Asia and a lot of Southeast Asian countries are growing. I think Indonesia is also growing really fast as well. But going back to China, Xi Jinping is, in a sense, a stable leader for internal mention. Externally, his goal, and I say this because I lived there for five of the years that he was in charge, so I know the person. I, I've listened to him speak. I've listened to the things he said versus the things he's done internally and, and publicly. And I know he doesn't like the West. He doesn't like the idea of his people having access to Western culture. He doesn't want them learning or speaking English. He thinks China is the best country in the world, and he expects everyone that wants to do business with China to learn Chinese. When you have the leader of the United States and the leader of China come to the table with such a very different view of what the world means and in collaboration and communication and these kinds of things, it's almost impossible to have a deal because the culture and the mindset is so different from the moment you get up to the moment you go to sleep. And so I fundamentally believe that there will at some point be a clash with China, as you said. All I know is I'm well positioned because I speak Chinese. I think it's a fair point, uh, Sean. But also, I want to add one thing. Again, I'm not an expert uh, in China or in Chinese politics, but uh, I'm trying to learn a little bit about Asia in general. And I read a book about different uh, characteristics of last five, six presidents and how the opening up policy works and how it doesn't work, etc. But one thing that I think we can give credit to China is in Chinese leadership, in Chinese political system, I mean, you are a statesman if you come to the point of presidency. You know, you learn you learn about local politics, you learn about global issues, you serve at a regional level, you serve in global level. So there's a, like an intense political training happening the last 30 years of your life because you're part of the party. You know, you have certain alliances and rivalries within the party. But it's a process and they produce similar type of leader at the end of that uh, machine, right? So at the end of this process, you are a reasonable president uh, for China. In the U.S., I mean, it's amazing that everyone can be president, but like how someone has zero experience in politics, in diplomacy, in international affairs, and looking at every single issue from like a business point of view and negotiation, like Donald Trump becomes a president. So 
I'm more worried about Donald Trump being the president of the United States than any person who can be the Chinese president, because I know the Chinese system will not produce a crazy president. Uh, of course, the combination of a uh, stable president in China and crazy president in the U.S. is the worst post-potential combination because China is there to challenge the system. And what I'm worried is, like, all last 20 years I've been following global politics closely, U.S. was always the reasonable actor, like, m- focusing on certain human rights issues with Bill Clinton and, you know, like Barack Obama. Now, like the moral leadership of the world belonged to America for a long time. Right or wrong, people thought something happens bad in the world that the U.S. was involved in that somehow and like trying to resolve it, maybe make things worse sometimes, like Iraq, you know, or Middle East. But at least there was kind of moral leadership. China had never claimed that they are a moral leader. But unfortunately, we need that in global system. We need someone taking a responsible action for the benefit of humanity. Uh, And we've seen that lack of moral and responsible leadership in the COVID crisis because there is no international actor that is taking a step to take over the leadership of the fight against COVID. Everyone is for himself or herself in this whole war. Unfortunately, the only way that the world will have a global responsible leadership is when the United States will have that mentality. European Union tried that, and I love European Union idea. I believe long time that European Union could be the moral and effective global leader. But unfortunately, it's far from a reality and European Union is collapsing itself. It's sad for me to see. I study European Union and I know a lot about it and I learned a lot about it. But the only chance the world has now having a global and responsible leadership by the United States, I don't care about Republican, Democrat, but unfortunately at this point is. Joe Biden, who is running from the reasonable front, and hopefully uh, things are going to get normal. Otherwise, I'm really, really worried, not only about the United States of America, but I'm worried about the world. There's about 30 countries that I can count off my head that have specifically used the virus as a means to grab more power and control over their citizens. And it's quite sickening to see this. I think that there's this kind of unseen pendulum that swings about every hundred years from start to finish, where during this swing, you see going towards democracy and freedom. And we're kind of at the end of that swing where we're heading away from that and back towards oppression and things like you saw when Hitler was around, where you see a lot of fascism, communism, and totalitarianism and fear and controlling and and xenophobia. And it is quite scary because I, along with the rise of these uber powerful tech companies worth trillions of dollars with hundreds of billions of dollars in cash to, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees, global reach, control over what you're seeing every day on top of the rise of artificial intelligence and automation and the loss of jobs and the virus and the power grabs. It's hard for me to imagine what the rest of this century looks like, but I'm afraid it doesn't look that good when you combine it with climate change. It doesn't look good. Everything is connected. And in order to survive in this world, I don't know if you need to know Chinese because we're proud that there will be like a real-time AI translator in five years that you can communicate with everybody without even knowing languages. (laughs) So the technology, I mean, you know, taking, you know, I mean, going back to technology subject that, you know, it's, it's fascinating that everything's connected, but also makes it extremely difficult for any organization and any human being survive and being successful in for the next 20 years. We were talking about the importance of coding, like software coding, right? For example, like when I was giving speeches in Turkey about like, I don't know, it's crazy now, like seven, eight, ten years ago. You know, I was saying, hey, this STEM is the most important factor. We need to educate more computer scientists. More people should be coding rather than, you know, working at textile factories. Uh, we need to open more like uh, boots, you know, boot camps for like coding hackathons and everything. Now what? Guess what? Now we are 
uh, talking about no code software. So there is no need for coding <laughs> to build software anymore. There's a whole different ball game. You know, I was telling everybody to learn, you know, languages. I believe in personal, inter- in personal communication, but you know what? I mean, learning language may not be the most important thing for business and professional reasons because now they're like real-time translations. Even culture becomes extremely global. And in the past 20 years ago, we talk about how Hollywood became the norm, like the American culture going everywhere and people watching Hollywood movies. Now, using Netflix, I can watch Indian or Nigerian or Latin American productions in the U.S. This is the real multi-direction globalization, let me put it that way. That's why I was super encouraged. Like, okay, so things are global. Things are interdisciplinary. Things are much faster than it is. That's why I said, okay, so what is next? And I started my current company because basically Global Wongs is bringing all different cultures, all different expertises. If you're talking about Arab uprising, you need, you can have a climate change scientist. Uh, you can bring a sociologist that covering Middle East. You can bring someone, a political scientist, and you can bring like agriculture expert, put them together and talk to them about how my um, uh, FMB company will be impacted from that development in Syria. Even if I'm running this company in Latin America or somewhere else, that will be impacted from that specific development. So things are extremely confusing and challenging for business leaders and even anyone starting, not only leaders, for everybody, like starting their careers. So that's why I think we're in a very interesting times. And that's a Chinese proverb. It's been a fun conversation. I've enjoyed talking with you. I had so many other questions that I wanted to talk to you about, but I feel like the conversation we had was already quite interesting, very political. So hopefully people are interested because this is an entrepreneur podcast. But at the same time, I think it's important to discuss politics because as we've said during this conversation, that politics is actually very important within the confines of business and where you're doing your business and what business you're in, what industry and things like that. So I think no matter who's listening, they will be affected by what we say because their country is going through the virus and their culture is experiencing it in their own way. And a lot of those things. So the last thing I want to ask you is what's the most important piece of advice that you can share with everyone listening based on just everything you've lived so far? It's a cliche to say success in life depends on continuous self-improvement. That's even more and more true today as things move so fast. And, you know, skills become obsolete. Uh, New skills or new issues are dominating or agenda in business and politics is almost impossible to catch up, especially the technology field, right? I mean, things are becoming easier, maybe in terms of starting a company, having a plug and play systems, no code software and everything, but that makes things more competitive. More people can start companies now, more people can build organizations that can disrupt existing industries. So it's really important for everybody that wants to be successful in building a multidisciplinary formation. It's no longer just enough to think about, just to focus and narrowly specialize in one subject. There is a great book called Range. So Range uh, is written by Epstein. Uh, It basically explains you the way that uh, you to be successful there is no way that you can just be successful narrowly specializing in one factor. You need to understand uh, a little bit about politics, uh, culture, religions, the the magazine, you know, what's happening in the world, all this stuff, and then digest all this information and come up with disruptive ideas. Because otherwise, if you don't have 360 degree view of world, you're not going to come up with competitive edges that will take you to the next level in business or in life, in politics, wherever that you want to succeed. It's important that to have holistic approach to the world. So things are not just single-sided and stuff. Very important. I don't think I could say it better myself. So how can the audience find you online? 
Yeah, I'm on I'm on all social media platforms. Uh, LinkedIn, Jenk Sidar, Twitter, Jenk Sidar, Facebook. I would recommend everyone to check the platform globalwongs.com as well if they have specific expertise and uh, professional background so they can just sign up and monetize their expertise and insights directly on the platform. That's a passion for me to help people in different countries, especially in developing countries, uh, to have sources of additional income and more competitive with the Western world. So yeah, I'm available on most of these platforms. I'm easy to find and my email is jank at globalwonks.com. All right, great. Well, it's been a fascinating conversation. I don't normally get to speak with someone who understands the world uh, at least as good as me, if not probably better. And uh, to have a civil conversation, because I know it's not very easy to have civil conversations these days with people. So, <laughs> And uh, there's one thing that I like to say at the end of every podcast that I do. Entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>